I went, when I went to school, started school, I had a, my last name was Boardman, and uh, until I was in, I think, fourth grade when we were legally adopted. And uh, they go back to your birth certificate and take that name out and put in the name that you were adopted by. And that's what God has done with us. Yeah. He's taken the old name, the old us, yeah. and given us a new name. Amen. A new name. Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we'll carry that name throughout eternity because of our Heavenly Father who loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, He died for us so that we could take on this new life, the life of our God and our Father, our Abba. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap again. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, never mind. I don't Yeah, you're standing. I just thought maybe she wants to share something. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't mind me. I'm just having a senior moment here, but it'll pass. Praise the Lord. That's the good news. It's premature senility. Premature is the key here. Praise the Lord. What do you call a fake noodle? In pasta. <laughs> Did you hear about the, the news this morning? Cheese factory in France exploded and there was nothing left but debris. <laughs> <laughs> Two birds sitting on a perch, and one says to the other, You smell fish? <laughs> perch, perch. Come on, Don. I know you fish. Anybody cold? If you are, just stay in the corner. It's 90 degrees. <laughs> no, you're right. That's what I tell my wife. But she's, she's in and out, going out on the deck about every 20 minutes because it's too cold in the house for her. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, when I was a kid, we were, you know, this is Iowa, so everybody's kind of, even if you lived in town, you were still kind of exposed to the, back then, maybe not so much now, to, to rural life, you know, to farming and so on and so forth. And uh, our cow, we had a cow, and our cow wouldn't give milk, and so we sold him. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still wondering who the first person was that saw a cow and said, looked at those dangly things and said, I think I'll squeeze those until something comes out, and then I'll drink it. <laughs> Okay, I was, uh, I was going through, this is an old Bible, it's the Bible that I use all the time, but uh, I had, I've used different ones over the years, but the, I, I always end up going back to this one. And I noticed something that I had forgotten, to be quite honest, I had actually forgotten all about it, but I had written in here in 1989, this is just before Sally and I moved back to Iowa, uh, we'd been living in Texas for a number of years, and and that's where we had a real encounter with the Lord and, and were truly born again. We may have been born again before, you know, but you know how that goes. Sometimes you can pray a prayer and something actually happens, but because you don't feel anything happen or you don't see any immediate changes, you just go on. And, but this was an experience that I knew God had done something, and so it was the opportunity that uh, God used to save us. But in the, in the Bible... Our pastor, uh, they were really good to us and helped us out. And we tried to start the church in Ankeny, and, and they uh, they supported us for for a while, a good while. And uh, they're still they're still friends of ours. Sally contacts back and forth all the time on Facebook. But uh, this is a prophecy that my pastor, Brother Edwards, uh, prophesied over me before we left. This is 1989, and it's from Romans chapter 9 and verse 28, and I had written this in here, and you know how many times you read over things and don't even look, I've got so many notes and scribbles and scratches that I don't even know what happened to mean anymore, but still, at that time, this was the prophecy, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now, i got to tell you, for a number of years, I thought, man, did he miss this, because this short work has turned into about 30 years, you know, and 35 years now, and uh, 
But what he was talking about is when God does what it is God's going to do. Now, we do, we do things all the time. Everybody does. We all are. And we're trying to, we're witnessing to our children and our grandchildren. And we're trying to, you know, be uh, what God's wanting us to be and to do and so on and so forth. But what, and so I assumed that that meant, wow, this will be a quick deal. You know, it won't take long and we'll have a mega church and everything will be great and all that. But that isn't what he was prophesying. Whether he knew it or not, you know, a lot of times the prophet doesn't even know for sure what the prophecy means. He just knows that that's what the Lord said. And what I've come to learn is that when God does this, now it isn't that God isn't with us. It isn't that God hasn't been involved in whatever we've been doing. But it's when he does this work, the finished work, it's going to happen quickly. So everything that we thought, you know, we poured our life into thinking that this was it. The truth is, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of what the, the thing is. But when God actually fulfills the word, it don't take long at all. It doesn't take a, a heartbeat. God can do in a breath what we've tried to do in a lifetime. It doesn't make the trying wrong. It just means that you just keep doing what you do until God does what God can do. Amen? And that's what will happen. I believe it will happen in all of our lives, whether it's things that have been prophesied or prayed over us. They will happen. But they'll happen quickly. Amen? And the older I get, the quicker I realize it's going to have to happen. Praise the Lord. I mean, or the faster it will have to take place. So I just well, I wanted to bring that up to, because I know that we're all going through stuff, and we all have promises. We all have had things prophesied over us. But I think this really speaks to the issue that, Yes, our lives are all about this, moving in that direction, trying to get to this place that God has designed for us, like Tim was talking about earlier. And we do what we can do, but God's the only one that can really make it happen. We just stay faithful to the Lord, and he'll bring it to pass. So whatever it is that's over your life that you're, you're believing God for, don't give up. Just keep believing God and watch him work. Watch him do the work that only he can do, and he'll do it in your life. I promise you he will because he cannot go back on his word. Amen. Give him a hand again. This morning. Praise God. All right. Praise God. All right. Let's get started. I want to start with uh, Romans chapter 7 and verses 17 through 20. And I want to thank Tim. Again, great job as always. And you speak so much to the things that God has put on my heart to share. And so that's always a witness to me and it, it, it blesses me and helps me. But it's also just in and of itself, it's good. It's good for everybody. It's the word of God. It's the truth of God. And and I appreciate that very much. Praise the Lord. And, and Suzanne and uh, Peter and Tammy, thank you for leading us in worship. And Mike, thank you back there for flipping the right switches and pushing the right buttons and all that. Praise the Lord. Amen. So now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Praise the Lord. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So Paul's talking about here in Romans 7 about being uh, what we are, flesh and blood, but also being spirit beings. And he's saying what he's trying to get across to us here is that what you think is you is not you. That used to be you, but now it's just a vehicle to get you around, to get you from place to place. Amen. But who you are is a spirit. And your spirit... That's who God identifies with. That's what was created in his image. Amen. And so you are sinless. Yeah. Amen. You're just like Jesus. Yes. But we're still capable of committing right. sinful acts in the flesh through, our, through the sense realm. And we, uh, the truth is all sin is just simply coming short of the glory of God or not measuring up to what God's word says about us, who we are, Tammy, or, or what we can do and so on and so forth. And so Paul's trying to get us to understand what the enemy does is come and condemn us for the very thing he tempts us to do. Now, your spirit is pristine. It's, it's never going to get any better than it was the moment you got born again. It's just like Jesus. And that's who God says you are. That's what God calls you by the same name. We have all taken on the name. Amen. And we are the children of God. Yes. Now, we're capable of really doing stupid stuff. And if you're anything like me, 
You do it frequently. Amen? But the thing we have to get our head around is, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ, I'm, I'm as good as it's ever going to get. So I have to, I have to deal with this thing. I have to rebuke it sometimes. I have to correct it. I have to deal. But it, it, it'll kind of try to take its own path. And it does it because of the flesh. The flesh is simply the five senses. It operates sensually. It operates by what I hear, by what I see, by what I taste, smell, and so on and so forth. It wants to control me by those things. But the Word of God says that we are a spirit. Amen? And in, in that spirit, who we truly are, we are the righteousness of God. This is incredible. I mean, to just think about the fact that God has says, as righteous as I am, that's what I declare you to be. Praise the Lord. Amen. So there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, he's not, here he's not talking about committing acts of sin. He's talking about being led or being affected by the flesh instead of by the spirit. Amen. There's no condemn. I feel absolutely no condemnation. If I can focus on me being the righteousness of God in Christ, I'm not going to feel any condemnation. I'm not going to have any condemnation. But the moment I drift back to Nathan, yes. then there's condemnation everywhere. And a lot of it's coming from me. Because yeah. I know it was bad. It was wrong. It was stupid. It was, uh, you know, it j I, I wasn't patient enough. I didn't wait. I didn't think. I just reacted or responded, you know, to a situation. We can all do that. And most of the time we do, especially if we get caught in a in a tight situation or uh, where there's a lot of pressure, we, we usually respond in some uh, negative way. So that's, that's where we are first. In Christ, no condemnation. Ex totally accepted in the beloved. Amen? All right, then let's go to Psalms 23, and I want to read the entire 23rd Psalm. And I can tell you, I've, I've obviously done a lot of funerals over the last 35 years or whatever it's been, and Psalms 23 is one of the Psalms that we always use or the, the, the family may request it, you know. But it's always bothered me. It's always made me a little uncomfortable. I've, I've memorized it. I've said it to myself many, many times. But it always makes me feel like, ooh, he's, he's trying to spook me here. He's trying to scare me about this going into this valley of the shadow of death. And I'm thinking, well, everybody's got a little hesitancy there and uh, anxiety about it because, I mean, we only do it once. so And we haven't done it yet. And that's kind of the reason for it. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 17, and we'll read verses 9 through 24. Praise the Lord. 1 Kings 17, 9 through 24. And you all probably know this story. We've, we've heard it plenty of times and read it. So this is uh, the prophet. He's gone through a bunch of stuff, and... Uh, God was feeding him by the ravens, and he had a big issue with uh, Ahab and, and the religious uh, people of, of uh, idolaters and so forth. And so God says, Arise, get thee to Seraphath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow, a widow woman there, to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, 
Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O, man, o thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him on his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Praise the Lord. So there's several uh, concepts here that are bound up together. Over and over in the scripture, we see it all the time. It's about God's provision. His provision of food, his provision of the truth of God's word, and the gift of life. Those are three uh, consistently connected truths throughout the Bible's declaration of God's provision for his people. And so there's a literal sense that God provides daily bread for his children. And of course, we need to eat to stay alive. But then there's the other idea, this sense in which God's words of truth are sustenance in themselves. Anybody ever had a promise that you've hung on to that kept you going when nothing else would? Amen. God's promise itself is said to keep us alive. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. The answer said it's written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it's not just physical uh, bread that we need to live, obviously. It's God's word that sustains us and that gives us nourishment. It's his promise that gives us hope. Amen. It's his declarations that give us guidance. His blessings that give us joy. Amen. And when the children of Israel became slaves to the Egyptians, God's method for delivering them was to take a lamb, Take it into your house, eat it in the night, roast it in fire, then put the blood on the doorposts of their houses. So if the word that the Lord is sharing here is that if you get enough Jesus in you, amen, something will come to you. There'll, there'll be understanding. There'll be some revelation, amen, that, hey, I was born for something more than this. This is not what God had intended for me. It's got more than me being a slave or, or being, uh, you know, controlled by other situations, Right. So then in Psalms 23, if you'll go back there again, Peter. We'll just cover a few things here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So he prepares a table, amen, before me in the presence of my enemies. Praise the Lord. God always puts something on the table that you can feed on that will deliver you from your oppressors, from whatever it is that's trying to come upon you or to trying to control you or to depress you or to cause you to come into fear. Amen. So because the Lord is our shepherd, amen, we will lack nothing. Praise God. We will make the impossible possible. Amen. And he'll make us to lie down and find rest. Or you could say, my rest flows from an understanding of being fed. I can relax because I know God's going to take care of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. He feeds me in the shadow of death. And here's what I'm thinking. Maybe that death is not my death. He's going to feed me in the shadow of the death of his son. He's going to feed us on the shadow of his death on the cross. 
He feeds me. He sustains me by the knowledge of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the shadow that falls. Amen. Remember it said that when Jesus hung on the cross, everything went dark. Shadow covered everything. Amen. So when we feed on that, it brings us through the valley of the shadow of death without fear. And with an anointing on us that runs down over us like it talks about in the scripture and then fills the cup. Praise the Lord. Until our cup runs over. It, it's divine supply that produces paradise. Yes. That produces everything that God has promised us. That anoints us so that we can be the righteousness of God in Christ in this earth. So that people can see Christ. So that God can be revealed. Amen. Through us. Because the Lord is our shepherd. We lack nothing. We will lack nothing if we believe. He'll make us lie down and find a place of rest. In green pastures. Now in Revelation 4, uh, there's a rainbow about the throne it talks about. And it's like unto an emerald, the scripture says. So the rainbow in scripture is a reminder of covenant, right? Yes. It was the covenant God made with everybody on earth. And he said, I'm going to put a rainbow up here. And every time you see the rainbow, you'll re be reminded that I am in covenant with you, right? And so look, let's just look at this quickly. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee these things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And so in Revelation 4, there's a throne a rainbow, and an emerald. The throne is a symbol of his kingdom, that God rules and reigns, amen? The rainbow is a symbol of the new covenant, amen? And the fact that it's the color of an emerald green is also significant because it connects with Psalms 23 where he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Praise the Lord. The, the, the rainbow... What, what, what is the green pasture? The green pasture is my confidence in this covenant that God's never going to leave me or forsake me. That he's, he's promised me that no matter what I go through in life, he's going to be there for me. He's going to supply every need. Amen. And he's going to do it by my recognition, amen, of the shadow of the cross or the effect of the cross and what Jesus did on that cross. Praise the Lord. So we can say it like this. My rest flows from an understanding of being fed on new covenant realities, on a, on a new covenant with God, that reality. It, he feeds me in the shadow of his death. Praise the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. Acts 17, 28. So he said, we live and move, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And so this amounts to a spiritual life that can't be compartmentalized away from our natural life. See, that's what Jesus discovered. His, his natural life wasn't separate from his spiritual life. It just was normal life. I mean, that, that's, that's the way we have to understand. It isn't how pristine we are in terms of never failing or never making mistakes. It's about the connection between our reality, amen, in the world that we live in, and the fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, that we are the offspring of God, amen? This, it's repeated throughout the scripture, this concept of provision. It points consistently to a spiritual life that correlates to our physical life. This is exactly what Tim was talking about. We are what we are for the impact that we can have spiritually, not necessarily physically, Although God uses our physical being and blesses us physically, it's really the physical being is simply the, the means by which he gets the spirit to people, to other people, so other people can, can connect, amen? Everybody learned in school, amen, that it takes oxygen, water, and food. And that's what makes us able to live, right? To move, to have strength, to have energy and everything else. But the Bible tells us, no, it's in God that we're able to do those things. Praise the Lord. God is life itself. Yes. Christ is life itself. Yes. Amen. We can't live apart from God. The, song that we, the songs we were just singing, it's his breath in my lungs. Yes. 
Without God, I, we don't exist. We, we would evaporate. We would be gone. Everything is held together, amen, by His Word. Yes. Amen. Think about it. Jesus took this truth, and in His, pardon me, jesus way, amen, He made it about Himself. Yes. Praise the Lord. He irritated everybody, amen, as far as the Jews were concerned, amen, by talking and taking everything that God had done uh, and everything that God had said under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, and he said, that's about me. This is all about me. Yep. Amen. And he said he was fulfilling the law. He, he exercised authority over the temple system. We know he did. He went out and run the money changers out and, and all of that. That, he said that the prophets were all talking about him. Every prophecy that ever went forward, it was always pertaining to me. Amen. And then he assumed the mantle of the high priest and the sacrifice. I mean, this guy's obsessive. I mean, that's what they had to be thinking. If they didn't recognize who he was, they would think that this guy's on the biggest ego trip that's ever been. I mean, he's flipped out. Amen. He was messing with their religion. Praise the Lord. The greatest need anyone has is a God-given revelation of who Jesus Christ is to each one of us. Yes. Who He is to you. Amen. It needs to be unique. It needs to be real to you. It needs to be personal. Praise the Lord. We call it a personal relationship, but it's really a, a personal revelation. Amen. Of who God is and what God's wanting to do in your life. Amen. A revelation of Jesus to you will produce a revelation of Jesus through you. Until you get a revelation, you can't be a revelation. You can't share a revelation you don't have. Praise the Lord. So the Jews were, they were angry. They were, they were upset with Jesus. Whenever he took one of their most sacred uh, memories, amen, of God's provision, and then turned it into himself. Just think of like the manna alone in the wilderness. He, he, he made it all about him. In John 6, right before Jesus uh, declares himself to be the bread of life, John tells the story of Jesus uh, feeding this huge crowd. Let's look at this in John chapter 6, uh, verse 5 through 13. And you know, again, you know the story, but let's just put it in the context of what we're talking about here this morning. Kid, they, they got these thousands of people out here that he's preaching to, and nobody's eating anything, and he's afraid they're going to be fainting and falling out before they can get back home. And so he said, well, we need to feed them. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred penny worth of bread isn't sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men set down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. That's just the men. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Verse 29 through 35. So he took what looked like not enough and turns it into more than enough. Praise the Lord. And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They say it un therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So this obviously it's a picture of God's provision like the widow's uh, limited meal and, and oil, right? So the loaves and the fishes feed 5,000 with a whole bunch left over. Jesus is abundance. That's the point he's trying to make, amen? Typically, we think abundance as being extra money or, or more stuff. And certainly God will meet our physical needs. But the truth is, abundance is having so much it overflows. That's the idea of the anointing that's on us that 
my cup runneth over. It's, it's so, Jesus connects with me in such a powerful way that there's overflow. There's always more. There's al if I believe, if I trust, amen, there's always more than enough. It's about being more than just provided for. It's being excessively provided for. It's the, the doting father or grandfather that just, whatever you ask for, I'm going to give it to you. In fact, I'll give you stuff before you have a chance yes. to think of ask for it. Just because I like to give you stuff. I enjoy the giving. And anybody that's been in the position to do that knows it's fun. It's fun to see their eyes light up and see them get excited and be all happy over something that may not be that expensive, but it's just something they really would like to have or enjoy. Amen? And that's what the way God looks at us. He just wants to give us all good things. He wants to bless us with all good things. Amen? So John 6, verse 35 Jesus then goes on to explain this whole thing about the feeding and the, the manna and everything else. And he, and he says, I'm the bread of life, right? Well, then he goes on to say that he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. I mean, do we really ever think about some of the stuff we read? If you come to Jesus, he said, you're never going to go hungry. That's what... David had discovered, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've lived a long time, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen him begging for bread. Because he that comes to me will never hunger. And he that believes on me will never thirst. We have to have him in us to live. It's not rules and regulations. It's him. Amen. John 15, uh, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's about sustenance, not enhancement. He's talking about sustaining you, supplying you, providing for you. Amen? Now, Jesus fuses his living in us with our living in him. But the bottom line is this unequivocal statement that without him there is no life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were, as far as God was concerned, you were dead. Yes. Amen? Until you came to him. Yes. And the moment you came to Christ and were born again, he quickened not only your spirit, he made you alive in the spirit, by giving you his spirit, but he quickened your mortal body, amen, by that spirit. So that your mortal body can do stuff that other mortal bodies can't do. And you can believe for things, even though you're in the sense realm, even though you have those five senses as a part of your flesh, you can overcome that by focusing on the spiritual reality of who you are. Amen? So it's, it's sustenance. It's, it's not enhancement. Jesus mixes this idea of us being in him, him being in us. And so I know as an, uh, a new... Christian, that always kind of confusing. Am I in him? Is he in me? What is this? And he's just talking about we become one, and that's when life begins. Yes. Before that, we were done walking dead. Amen? So apart from him, we can do nothing. There is nothing outside of Christ except death. That's all there is. Because when, we're when, when we go into eternity, why? Because we're in Christ and Christ is in us. We, we have been become eternally life forces, amen, the moment we got born again. We're eternal beings. We're eternal creatures from the moment we got born again. We're never going to die. Who we are is never going to die. This thing will fold up at some point, amen, but I'm not going to go. I'm not going anywhere. And the amazing thing is my mind to the point that it's not renewed, will be renewed instantly upon death, yeah. upon physical death. Amen? Because in heaven, I'm going to know everybody, yeah. and they're going to know me as I was known. So therefore, my God, I'm still going to have the personality. Sadly, you're going to have to deal with that. But, but you know what I mean? But not the proclivity to sin, to, to let the flesh overcome me, because I, I, I no longer have the five senses ruling my life anymore. I have a glorified body that's perfectly in tune with the Spirit, and all it knows is what the Spirit knows. Praise the Lord. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about that. Amen. And the fact that I get to continue with puns throughout eternity. 
I may, I may seriously have my own mansion simply because he don't want me messing with everybody else. Irritating him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But God is great. Amen. Romans 5 verse 17. And see, that's why it's so critical that we get this understanding that Paul finally came to. He said, hey, look, the harder I try, the better to be, the worse I am. We all know that. You know, we, how many vows do we make a week, you know, that I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to let her trip my trigger. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm not going to say something that I'll regret later. You know, I love the woman, but, you know, sometimes, whew. Anybody been married more than a week? Hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about. It's not about not loving each other. It's about we get on each other's nerves sometimes. You don't sleep really good one night. Yeah, the next day you're not, you know, all that wonderful. And, and they'll say something or you say something. And the next thing you know, it's, you know, you said something you have to then regret. Praise the Lord. But I'm saying that's what Paul is trying to get us to understand. We let that determine ourselves. We let that dictate who and what we are when he's trying to get us to understand, yes, you're going to screw up because you're still in that flesh. You're still in that body. But don't let that dictate to you who you are and what you are. You've got to be able to forgive and forget just as you hope that they'll do the same thing for you. But the first thing you've got to do is forgive yourself. Because if you're running around with condemnation, that's not pretty to be around. They're grumpy. They're upset. They're trying to deal with all their own issues. And, or I am trying to deal with mine. And then somebody else comes on and just a little thing is enough to twick you. You know, I mean, flip you out. So that's the idea. The more we understand our true nature, or who, our, what our real identity is, as, as Tim was talking about, as Tammy was talking about, that's the key. That's the key to opening all the doors in the spirit so that we can operate as we really are. And who we really are. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. We are all, until we were born again, we were all reigning in the death of Adam. His separation from God. Every one of us carried on the same thing. And the whole world is still doing that. That's why it's not surprising that they're trying to get us to hell in a handcart as quickly as possible. By just... Not thinking spiritually, by not operating, amen, by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So, again, abundance of grace is reigning in life. That's ruling. That's where you are seated with Him in heavenly places, amen, where you really are a child of God, where you really are an heir to the throne, hallelujah. Praise God, amen. So, let's, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 4. Uh, oh, wait a minute, before you do that. Let's go back to Romans 7 again, verse 17 through 20. We reign in life by the abundance of grace, by God's forgiveness and his impartation of his righteousness to us, we reign. We rule. We are seated with him in heavenly places as he is, so are we in this earth, right? So that's the point Paul's trying to make here. Now then, so then it can't be me anymore that's sinning. Not if I know who I am, right? It can't be me. It's no more I that do it, but it's the sin that dwells in this flesh, in the members, in the, in the body. Praise the Lord. Because I know that is in this flesh, and we all know this if we're honest with ourselves, there's nothing good about it. It always wants what it wants and more. Amen. At, at any cost, praise the Lord, Dwell, dwelleth no good. For to will is present in me. So I want to do, I don't want to get upset with my wife. I don't know if make it sound like we're on the verge of a divorce. We got over that about 30 years ago or so. Uh, but I'm just saying, it, it's, it's not, it's in me, in my flesh, is the will to be right, to be in charge, to set everybody else straight, because they're all messed up. Yeah. Right? I mean, because I know. Amen. Yeah, in my flesh. There's no good thing. For to will is present, I want to do, but when I get in pressure, when I get aggravated, this thing shows up. And it wants me to be convinced that this is me. That's you. You'll never change. You know, you're always going to be a foul up. You'll always screw something up about the time God's ready to move. And then you'll mess it all up. For to will is present. But how to perform it, I can't find it. I think I found it until the next time I get aggravated or get into a bind or in some situation that I just react to rather than, you know, slowing down and thinking a little bit and responding by the Spirit. Amen. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I don't want to do, I end up doing. 
And anybody else ever get so frustrated with this that you think, what in the world is the point? The harder I want to do the good stuff, the more it seems like all the crap comes. And I respond to it the same way it came to me, you know, instead of operating by the Spirit, right? So now if I do that, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, then it's not me that's doing it, right? This isn't paranoid schizophrenic talking here. This is he's identified the fact that, okay, now I've discovered who I really am. And that's the righteousness of God in Christ. So if I'm still doing this, it can't be me that's doing it because Jesus never sinned. Right? If I am the righteousness of God, in other words, if I've taken on Christ, then this, if I understand this, it can't be me that's sinned. That's what Paul, that was the revelation that Paul had and that he's trying to share with us. So if I do what I don't want to do, then it's not me that's doing it. But it's the sin that's in my members. Praise the Lord. All right. 17 uh, through 20. All right. And then 8 verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation if you stay focused on the Spirit. The flesh is going to do stuff. We're not encouraging that. We're not trying to get it. I just know it's going to happen. I don't, you know, it just will. As long as we're in the flesh, there's the potential for failure. You know, for coming short, right? But that's why he's telling us you cannot focus on that. Because if you do, it'll rob you of your identity. And you'll be under condemnation all the time instead of being free to do what God wants you to do and feeling competent, amen, and able to do everything that God says. You'll be so focused on your failure that it'll take you six months to get... You know, that's what we used to do in the holiness is we would... You know, that's what was so amazing about this prophecy from my pastor. I love the man. But look, that isn't where they were coming from. And anybody that was in that organization or religious kind of belief knows that isn't what he was talking about. He was talking about God's going to do this and God is going to do it, but he's going to do it. He's going to use me to do it. The righteous he's talking about is me, right? The righteous, when I come to that understanding, then God, that gives God the flow or the free hand to move and to do what only he can do in me. I can't do it because the harder I try to do it, the more frustrated I'll get. Because of the flesh, because of the senses, because of what I'm seeing as a result or what I'm hearing about as a result, right? Praise the Lord. So, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In other words, who are being led by what God says about Him rather than what I'm saying about myself or the situation or the enemy. Praise the Lord. All right, Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, The man receives sinners and eats with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? So Jesus was about rescuing the lost. His response to their saying he's eating with sinners all the time is that my focus here is the lost, is the sinners is the ones who don't know me, who have no uh, religious training, who have no understanding of this. Amen. He was providing himself as the sustenance for eternal life. Praise the Lord. He sat down and he had dinner with the lost. I, I'm telling you, there was a time when, uh, and again, if you were kind of brought up or, or, or in, the, in a more religious uh, kind of church environment, you know that you weren't to, you weren't to uh, mix with sinners. You were to be separate. Come out from among them, you know. How are you going to affect them if you've you just got your own little group somewhere huddled down in your, you know, doctrines and everybody else can just go to hell, you know. I'll tell you, too, because we got that. Most of you have probably heard this, but I don't care. It's worth telling. Uh, when we got said, of course, you, you know, you got rid of the TV. You weren't supposed to have a TV. You weren't, there were all kinds of rules. That was just one of them. Now, in some ways, I can see the advantages of not having TV because there's a lot of crap on there you don't need. But it's not all that. It's just got to have sense enough to know which ones to watch and which ones to not. A little self-discipline will cure a lot of that problem. But nevertheless, we had to get rid of our TV. So, and I had all kinds of rock and roll and, you know, blues and the old 
LPs, you know, the old 33 and a thirds albums and stuff. I mean, they'd be worth a fortune today, but they were going to take me straight to hell because they told me it would. Yeah. Amen. So what did I do? I gave my TV and my records to my neighbor. <laughs> hell, he was going to hell anyway. What difference did it make? He might as well enjoy himself, right? I mean, that's, I, that's, that's where our heads were. Well, they don't care. They're going to hell. So, you know, give them that junk and let them go to hell with it. And I'll just hunker down with my group and, right? Yeah, we'll just go out to eat. That's all there was to do. I mean, go to church and eat. Not that that's bad, but, you know, a little music once in a while wouldn't have been terrible either. But, but this, is, this is the idea of this great uh, repetitive picture of kingdom reconciliation, of God declaring us righteous, not us, not our works, not me burning the TV or throwing away a bunch of records or whatever. It was about what God did. What I did it was insignificant. It was irrelevant as far as God was concerned. All it was was a blessing to the sinful neighbor that I had. I <laughs> blessed him big time. It was a pretty good TV, as I recall. Anyway, so it's like when the prodigal comes home, the father calls for the fatted calf and he makes this big feast. And we're, gonna, we're just going to party. Yeah. Amen? And the older brother, the religious kind of picture there, hates it. Why? Because he's just like the scribes and the Pharisees saying, he's eating with sinners. Yeah. This guy just blew the money on, you know, the worst thing possible, you know, prostitutes and drunkenness and, you know, just reveling and, you know, carrying on. And you're going to, now you're going to have a feast with this guy. And the father says, yeah, he's my son. He was lost, but now he's found. I mean, that's something to celebrate. But the religious people, they wanted some punishment. We don't want him with us. He might spoil us somehow. He might mess us up. And so, you know, get rid of him. Or I'm not coming. I mean, I'm just not going to come. So Jesus talks about the kingdom, this life of the kingdom, amen, being a, a big banquet. A big wedding feast, a big party, where everybody's welcome. Praise the Lord. There's a seat for the worst sinner because God is providing acceptance and entrance. In fact, he's providing the meal, a, a forever course meal that never ends. Sustain, sustenance is what we're talking about. Here. I know we read it and we think, okay, I can't wait for the big banquet. And I'm not saying there won't be a physical reality there, but he's talking about something else besides that, and that is that I'm going to supply all your needs, and I'm not going to do it in some me meaningless, backhanded, weird way. I'm going to set a table before you. I'm going to, I'm, you're going to have a party. Amen. It's going to be like a feast. Life should be celebrated. It ought to be fun. It should, doesn't have to be fear and guilt and shame and every time I do something I gotta go oh my god now I've lost I've got to take six months of fasting and prayer and everything and no he's trying to tell us look life is to be good life is to be celebrated it's to be enjoyed it's supposed to be like a feast every day I'm gonna provide for you whatever it is you need cars not running I'll fix it I'll get you some somebody to help you fix it or I'll get you another one I'll, I'll get your credit to where you can get your own or whatever it takes amen I'll do it I'll, I'll give you more than enough but you got to believe. you gotta, you got to stay focused on that reality. Amen? It's not us living in Christ. See, it's the, the great news that God is giving us is the good news. And that is salvation is achieved by Jesus Christ and not by you. That's what makes it so amazing. It's such a gift. We didn't do anything. We didn't even ask for it. In fact, when he did it, we didn't even want it. While we were sinners, he died. While we were just totally oblivious to him and whatever his purpose or plan was, that's what he, that's what he gave everything for us. Yeah. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Praise the Lord. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now again, we're talking about the Spirit. And he says, I'm crucified with Christ. And yet, I'm still alive. But it's not me. This is not what's alive as far as God's concerned. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for his righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Can you, do you see the connection we're making here with Paul, what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 7? He's saying, I've, I've been crucified. It's not me that's living anymore, and yet I know physically I'm still here and walking around, but that's really not me. And, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So even though this doesn't say or reflect the true identity of who I am, I live it by faith, based on what Jesus said. Are you with Do you understand what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. So who loved me and gave himself for me? And so I don't frustrate the grace of God. How do I frustrate the grace of God? By making it all about me and how I failed or how I succeeded or whatever I did or didn't do. So I don't frustrate the grace of God. I just say, bring it on. I mean, I'll take it seconds. I'll, I'll have some more. You know, it's Oliver. May I have another? Praise the Lord. So just for if righteousness came by the law, then Jesus died for nothing. Because we would have had to achieve our righteousness by obedience or by works. Amen. Yeah. So Jesus died for a purpose. He died to give life. Amen. Eternal life. He died to give us God life. Amen. It's not us living. It's Christ doing the living. And the life that we live in our flesh and blood is made abundant by the flesh and blood that Jesus provided for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. That abundance is also called the grace of God. It takes it out of your hands. It takes it from you being responsible to him being responsible and you simply believing in that. See, we're just, look, look at this way. We're just like the blood and the wine. When you think of communion, which is to connect us to that reality and who we really are in Christ, right? And so it, we're, we're like the blood and the wine, just ordinary, earthly things, natural things, amen, declared sacred because of what they signify in relation to God's grace. We are sacraments, to be quite honest with you. Just like the elements of communion, we ourselves are vehicles of grace. We are made sacraments. We are human sacraments. And I, I looked the word up, sacrament, and it means oath of allegiance or means of grace, sacred character. That divines us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this sacrament, the sacramental reality in flesh, just like Jesus did, except Jesus' flesh never ruled him or controlled him. And the way we are to overcome is by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb, not by our effort, but by what he already did and our connection with it, our identification with it. Amen? So again, let's look at 1 Corinthians 10. And we'll read verses 14 through 21. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 21, Peter. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. There's talking about Jesus, obviously. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. <coughs> what say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. He's, saying, he's not saying don't. He's saying you can't. If you've become the sacrament, it's about the, the, the thing that made you the sacrament. Not about you. Praise the Lord. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of, and it's just like Paul saying, what I want to do, I don't do. But it's not me living anymore in this. It's Christ living his life through me. Amen. So I'm not, I, I can't be a partaker of the devil and be a partaker of God at the same time. 
Because I died to the devil when I came alive to God. Before that, I was alive to the devil and dead to God. But I got born again. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be complex. I'm just saying a lot of the stuff we read, we just don't make the connections. And so there are just a lot of random scriptures that we look at and go, wow, that's great. But how does it affect me? How does it pertain to me? How does it affect my life? Amen. Because God's trying to get some stuff to us. Because in this last day, there's going to have to come some revelation. There's going to have to be a people that grow up into the full stature of Jesus Christ in order for him to do the things that he's promised he's going to do. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, Jesus and his disciples celebrated this meal that, they, that he's talking about here, the Passover. Amen. And they did it to recall, just like all the good Jews, when God had passed over them because they were covered in blood. Where they were declared innocent, even though they weren't innocent, but because of the blood, they were innocent. Amen. They had a blood covering that marked them for life. Amen. And Jesus made it about himself. He wasn't being presumptuous when he said the Passover was all about me. Now, they didn't like it, but that was the truth. Amen. And the communion meal that Jesus gave us and the crucifixion that it recalls, and by extension the blood sacrifice of his crucifixion, are huge. They're insurmountable, unavoidable contradiction to self-help, to self-feeding, to self-supporting spirituality. The thing that he gave us was the, the, the biggest statement to say, it ain't about you. It's not what you're doing. It's what I've done. And when you partake of this meal, you're symbolizing what happened when you got born again. You you fed on me. You took me in. I became your sustenance. I became your righteousness. I became all that you needed to be in order for God to accept you and to love you as he loves him. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So the gospel is Jesus. He is the gospel. Amen. He's what we get when we come to him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Our reward and the giver of the reward are one and the same. The good news is Jesus Christ is not just God with us. But as Tim was saying earlier, it's God for us. Your shield and exceeding great reward. He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got the sides. He's got it all. Amen. Amen. The all-sufficient provision. Psalms 23, one more time, Peter. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Why don't I fear evil? Because I'm living from the shadow of his death. I don't have any fear of evil. He's overcome. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is abundant life. Praise the Lord. That's the rest that flows from an understanding of being fed, of being provided for in the shadow of his death, which produces paradise. Praise the Lord. So keep bringing your vessel, and he'll keep filling it. You. Amen. He'll keep pouring the oil. The oil will not fail. The anointing will not fail. It will do everything he has promised it will. The bread of life, Jesus himself, will always be there for you, will always be in you. Amen. Amen. Your cup will run over. Hallelujah. Look, church, we need to believe in the goodness of God. This is what Tim was talking about, has talked about frequently on Sunday mornings, and I appreciate that because that is the key. He's a good God. He's not angry. 
He's not mad at you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He gave everything so that you could live an abundant life, a life that overflows with God and all of that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. Stay cool somewhere. Amen. And enjoy the presence of the Lord. Just watch him pour out something good for you today. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.